Good morning. Good morning. We'll have more time to visit after church, so. <laughs> I want to welcome everyone this morning um, as we come to uh, worship the Lord, and we uh, we have um, a special guest uh, from Boise Bible College, um, Traber Cass is here, and he's going to be sharing a little bit about the college um, before he gets into his, his message, and then after uh, after the service and we go get refreshments, I'll holler at you guys, We those who would like to come back and hear an update about uh, the Bible College, uh, we'll have a, a meeting in here then. We do have a couple other announcements. One is that the Northwest uh, Christian Convention is uh, starting this week. We will be going, uh, taking the church van Wednesday and Friday night. We'll meet here at 530. So if you'd like to go for the evening session, uh, and uh, if you would like to be picked up because you don't like to drive at night, please, uh, please let me let me know. Uh, also, uh, with that, uh, appreciate your prayers. Tomorrow will be the Alexander Foundation Scholarship um, Golf Tournament in Staten, and I'll be helping with that. Uh, raising money to help send, uh, I was going to say young people, but they're not all uh, high school or uh, age, but uh, to send people to, to Bible college. Uh, and so I'm excited about, about that and the, the help that they can, can, that we can give them in raising up the next generation of, uh, of uh, church leaders. Tuesday morning, we're going to be having a work party from 9 to noon. Um, we're going to be, we got the classroom all cleaned out, and we got to do a little bit of sanding, but, and then we'll start painting the classroom and hallway so that we can, um, um, get uh, started with a Sunday school class for uh, young people. So uh, appreciate it if you can come and help with that. Oh, there are, uh, if you want more information about the, uh, we're going to take the van in the evening to the, the conference, but they also have the morning and afternoon sessions, so you can find out more information in the foyer about the Northwest Christian Convention. Any other announcements that need to be made? Great. If you have a prayer concern, you can write that on a prayer card and give that to me when I come around, and we'll be praying for that. We do pray for, um, on Monday mornings, we have our Caring Hearts, which is, we pray for the prayer requests that are given on Sunday, additional prayer requests from the group, and then some of the uh, ladies write uh, cards to different people. So if you'd like to, uh, like to invite you to come to that. Would you say our memory verse with me? Be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be men of courage, be strong, do everything in love. 1 Corinthians 16, 13, and 14. I want to read a, a poem, something for you to consider today. It's entitled, The Power of Kind Words, and the scripture they use is Matthew 5, 16, 
In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Will we walk through life with nothing to say, with a frown on our face which turns people away? For the ray of sunshine that is yours to share may lift someone's spirits from a world of care. A happy greeting can make one feel whole and go right to the heart and lift up one's soul. It can say, hey, you really matter, and help one to see an attitude adjustment could be a blessing to me. Look for small things you can sincerely compliment. For blessings like the, this can appear angel sent. And when we connect with nice things seldom heard, it can bring a smile to one's face for your kind words. And a thank you for your smile can brighten things more to where they perceive God's knock on their heart's door. The wonderful gospel comes through saints who care and seek God's divine appointments and then take time to share. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we, we do want to share our faith. Sometimes it's in the smallest ways. And sometimes it's in deep conversations. But God, help us to realize you do have divine appointments for us. And help us to have courage and boldness and just a love for those who are, are lost, Father. God, thank you that, uh, that Traber could be here to, to, today and, and I just ask that your hand of blessing would be upon him and on Boise Bible College. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, well, Steve, come on up, Steve. So we did this from Mother's Day to Father's Day, but if you have forgotten about uh, collecting money um, for the Crisis Pregnancy Center in, um, in Salem, if you want to just um, put... You're an offering in the envelope uh, and put it in offering uh, as it goes by, you can still give to help with that. these songs, because there's no piano, will be in the key of me. <laughs> oh, but you, you're invited to step in and do your best, okay? Here we go. Down at the cross where my Savior died, down where for cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name, glory to his name, glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied, glory to his name. I am so wondrously saved from sin. Jesus so sweetly abides within. There at the cross where he took me in. Glory to his name. 
Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. And somewhere in the 96th Psalm, give or take a Psalm or two, it says... Give God the glory that's due his name. Think about that one. And this one has lots of uh, things to think about because it's uh, count your blessings. Okay, so here we go. When upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged thinking all is lost, Count your many blessings, name them one by one. And it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. Count your blessings, name them, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what, see what God hath done. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. Are you ever burdened with a load of care? Does the cross seem heavy you are called to bear? Count your many blessings and doubt will fly. And you will be singing as the days go by. Count your blessings, name them, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. So amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged, God is over all. Count your many blessings, angels will attend. Help and comfort give you to your journey's end. Count your blessings, name them name by one. Count your blessings, see what, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. I'm going to make a quick comment. At the most debilitating time in my life, a um, person that I trusted left me and family was gone. I was working at a Christian school, too. And I was to help with a service. And I didn't pick out the songs, but guess what song was picked out first? <laughs> and actually, you know, it has turned out to be uh, really, really a... a uh, Great song, obviously, obviously. Uh, let me get the page turned here. Uh, yeah, I'd have to turn it. To, you see, sometimes the way that it's written, I can't really read it. So that's why I got this. So here we go. What a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we tried? 
Angels and temptations. Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful? Who will our, our sorrow share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Good. All right, here we go with Sweet Hour of Prayer. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer that calls me from a world of care and bids me at my Father's throne make all my wants and wishes known. In seasons of distress and grief, my soul has often found relief and oft escaped the tempter's snare by thy return, sweet hour of prayer. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, the joys I feel, the bliss I share of those whose anxious spirits burn with strong desires for thy return. With such I hasten to the place where God my Savior shows his face. When gladly take my station there and wait for thee, sweet hour of prayer. another psalm that says to seek the face of God and the rejoinder is thy face I seek that's uh, pretty deep stuff and actually it came up only because the verses I put in were different on Jenny Lou's and thank goodness I could read that last verse <laughs> morning. May I? Now I can see. You know, the world is full of religions, and every religion, in some form or another, seeks to unify man with God or deity. And they attempt to do this by bringing man to God through a system of beliefs and rituals intended to bridge the gap between the divine and man. There is only one religion in which God comes to man. In fact, I submit to you that being a Christian is not a religion. It is a relationship. It is, in its essence, the honest response of a person's heart as they come to know that God truly loves us, each of us. Despite knowing everything about us, from that bent toe or finger to those dark or nasty thoughts we sometimes might entertain, 
He still loves us to the point where he became a man and died the death we all deserve. He died in our place. And all he asks of us is to accept his love, his sacrifice, and follow him as Lord. For indeed, he is Lord. Praise God for his mercy and kindness. And we come, therefore, this morning to partake in communion, to remember God's love for us in Christ Jesus. As Paul tells us in Romans 8, starting at verse 35, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither the height nor depth or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Will you pray with me? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we enter the presence of your throne of grace in the name of Jesus, and we praise you for your mercy and your grace and your great love, which you showed us through the sacrifice of our Savior Jesus. We praise you for the power of your love, which raised Jesus from the dead and gives us victory over sin. We thank you for this bread, which is our communion with the body of Christ, and we thank you for this cup of blessing, which is our communion with the blood of Christ. Work in our hearts to make us instruments of your love. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
from the uh, 96th Psalm. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Proclaim good tidings of his salvation from day to day. Proclaim them. Tell of his glory among the nations, his wonderful deeds among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He's to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the people. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Our mission of the month is uh, cram the Christians that are there in uh, Asia, and they are indeed spending the word to all peoples. They're uh, not only in the most difficult of places, North Korea, but also uh, China, which is no easy place, but <laughs> maybe easier than North Korea, in the Philippines. And they have uh, work that uh, is in Vietnam, and maybe they've expanded elsewhere. But just uh, you can be assured that your money is uh, representing you well uh, with tithes and offerings. And, you know, each month we have a mission of the month. But we're not limited to just one mission, are we? I mean, we make that a special um, mission, and yet still we're uh, raising uh, money for... Uh, the Hope Crisis Pregnancy Center, a very deserving ministry, and there are many others like that. We have a person here in our midst who worked in a crisis pregnancy center, I'm told, managed and so forth. He's a dear soul and a great prayer warrior. Um, I taught what was euphemistically called citizenship, sometimes called civics, sometimes called government. Over the years, um, I was in Alaska at a Christian school where I first was nominated to go ahead and teach about government. Uh, that was back in 1982 or so. And a little comment from the daily bread when we're counting our blessings. You know, we thank God for our daily bread, don't we? And then Jesus said that he had food that the disciples didn't know about. They're, you know, in the fifth chapter of John, is it? The... Uh, no, maybe it's the fourth. Well, you can look it up. It's the woman by the well. And uh, that woman at uh, uh, Jacob's well. And the disciples go in to buy food for him. But when they come back, they discover he'd been talking to, the, to a woman and had uh, explained to her about the faith. And of all things, that was to a Samaritan woman. And when uh, the disciples came back, they were curious what he was up to and what he was doing, why he would talk to someone like that. But, and then, hey, we brought back the food, you know, let's, let's eat up. And he says, I've, I've got food that you don't know about. This daily bread involved doing the will of God. So that's a, an amazing thing to contemplate uh, as, as we give today. And we're going to get to hear some more about another fine ministry of the Boise Bible College. So there are many, many ways in which we can promote the will of God. Um, and at any rate, one of the things I wanted to mention was that we, our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. That is from Philippians 3.20. So, yes, we do have, you know, to render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and unto God what is God. What a what a way to end a uh, commentary on stewardship, huh? All right, let's pray. Most holy and gracious God, we thank you for our many blessings. We thank you for the blessing 
of you making yourself manifest as Jesus that we could know that our Redeemer lives, that he walked this earth, got the feet dusty, and washed off the feet of other dusty uh, disciples of his. Help us to be good friends to our friends. Help us to be good neighbors to our neighbors. And help us to be good citizens of your kingdom. May your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. If you want to turn to Psalm 34, will be a scripture reading. I didn't ask Tabor what scripture he'd like to have read since it was my 60th birthday yesterday. I thought I'd read to you my favorite scripture. So, uh, Psalm 34, God's word. Oh, before I get started on that, I didn't realize how young 60 actually. Psalm 34, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul will make its boast in the Lord. The humble will hear and rejoice. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant, and their faces will never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for, though, for to those who fear him there is no one. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they who seek the Lord shall not be in want of any good thing. Come, you, ch- you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is the man who desires life and loves the length of days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against evildoers to cut off the memory of them from the earth. The righteous cry and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and save those who are crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked and those who hate righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servant. And none of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. For per concerns, um, Laura is, is leaving Tuesday, so we pray. That, thank, we're glad that you've been with us. Uh, this and praying for tra- safe travel mercies back home. Just heard that Virginia Blackburn had a stroke and it was very severe. Uh, hospice has been called in, so we need to be praying for her and her family. Um, Praying for uh, Boise Bible College. Uh, they need students, and 
they, uh, they need uh, money, just put it that bluntly. So that's a, a per concern that uh, we, especially, we talk, I talked a couple weeks ago about the need for, uh, for people to go to Bible colleges to be trained in the ministry. And uh, that need has probably never been greater. And I'm not exaggerating that. And so we need to be praying for the Boise Bible College uh, camp reps as they go and spend time in camps and uh, recruiting uh, students to come to, to Boise. Uh, we need to be praying for our churches that we would raise up people who would go to Bible college and encourage people to go into the ministry. And then Jack gave me a, told me about a movie that's coming out July 4th, The Sound of Freedom. Uh, it, is, it is about the child sex market and $150 billion a year that that generates. And so praying that the movie would open people's eyes, praying for those that are working to uh, rescue these children, uh, praying for those who are trying to uh, stop what's going on and prosecuting the, those who are exploiting our children and doing terrible harm to them. So let's go bring these before the Lord. Our Father in heaven, we come before your presence, and God, we, we thank you. We thank you that you are our eternal Father, and God, that, that uh, you are always there for us, that you redeem the soul of your servants. We look forward to to Christ's return, to eternity. But while we look forward to that, Father, help us to live faithful lives here on earth. Lives that make a difference, an eternal difference. God, we, we pray for C.Y. Kim and... Uh, uh, the Christ Reaching Asia Missions. God, I thank you for the work that's going on throughout the world, and we pray that you would open up your storehouse of blessings and pour into the mission. Continue to give them boldness, as, uh, and that many, many more people would come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Lord, we pray for Laura. She's uh, traveling back home. Thank you that she's been here with us and uh, has being part of our church family. And I just pray for her safety as she travels, Lord. God, uh, my heart goes out to the evil that is being put upon our children, God. And... God, I, I just I just pray that this movie would open up people's eyes to see that evil and be willing to do their part to put a stop to it. I pray for those that are rescuing these children as well as even an adult woman father. And, and I, I just ask that you would... Uh, supply the funds that they need. God, I pray that for those that are standing up against this evil, I pray for their protection. And I pray that your hand would be upon those, against those who are harming these, these children, Lord. God, we... We pray that for, for, for Virginia and 
God, I just, I just ask that you would help, uh, help her family, Lord, and help them to, to seek you during this time. I, I just ask that for your will to be done in that situation. God, I thank you for Boise Bible College and for their willingness to stay true to their mission of training up leaders for the church, missionaries and preachers, youth ministers, that and we, I just pray uh, for a blessing on Boise Bible College, God. And that you would supply their their need, their financial need. Lord, and that you would uh, raise up these men and women who would say yes to your calling. Yes to go on the mission field. Yes to preach your word. Yes to be leaders in the church. And so I pray for the, the camp reps that are, that are going out this, this summer. Uh, give them energy. Help them to get the, the rest they need. Uh, but use them uh, to be able to challenge some young people to uh, make that commitment. I pray for our church camps. and I mean, it's at church camp where I heard the call and accepted that call, God. And so I just ask that you would be with uh, the camps and the directors and that you would really place in their heart to um, really have that call go forth. Lord, we, we do want to uh, pray for uh, our church as we uh, look to how we can uh, minister and how we can reach out to families and children. God, just give us wisdom. Uh, give us insight. And God, give us a, a willingness to just give, give ourselves to this community. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Traber has uh, been with with Oza, Ozark. He's <laughs> never been to Ozark. <clears throat> Ozark is where I went to Bible college. So for those who 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 may not know that, has been with Boise Bible College, uh, which all three of my kids have went went to, and um, for four years, um, working in the Area of advancement. He works with donors, alumni, and churches, as he's doing with us today. Um, he was uh, 20 years in ministry, uh, and in Colorado, Idaho, and Montana, uh, graduated from Boise Bible College. And um, he's going to share a little bit about the, about what's going on at the school and then um, preach, and then we'll, um, we'll have some refreshments and come back and be able to hear more about uh, the work that's going on at Boise. So let's welcome him. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for having me here this morning. Um, Mike is right that the need is greater than it ever has been before, um, as far as I know. Um, I'll, I'll show you a little bit uh, more afterwards when we meet afterwards, but uh, I've got a slide here. I think it's the first one of a map um, of the Northwest United States. And uh, <clears throat> so if you can see the little, the little dots, um, the... The red dots represent churches that we're affiliated with in some way, partner churches, um, just, just mostly Christian churches, churches of Christ across the Northwest. 
that, that we're affiliated with in some way. The blue dots represent what we call open pulpits. And this, this is a growing uh, thing. We're still in the midst of a survey, and like I say, I'll, I'll share a little more about this afterwards. Um, but what we're finding right now so far in this survey is that uh, between open pulpits and pastors who are over the age of 60, <laughs> I know, the timing is, uh, yeah, <laughs> I saw that Mike's birthday was yesterday, and so, so he's just, just barely over 60, right? <laughs> so, so not over yet. So, but between those two categories, open pulpits and pastors over the age of 60, it's almost 50%. And so what, what spurred all this was back in November, my boss, Scott Lerwick, and I were back in Columbus, Ohio at, at ICOM, big international missions conference. And uh, we met a guy there. He's actually from Boise. We had to go to Columbus to meet him. He's from Boise. But um, he, what he does is he connects retired pastors to interim preaching positions. And he's finding um, that... Well, they've done surveys too, and he says that by the year 2030, which is coming right up, 72% of current pastors will retire. Now, I don't know if you guys have watched and, uh, and sort of seen what's going on in the church world out there, um, but the need west of the Rockies is, is dire and uh, for church leadership. And we're not the solution, but we want to be part of the solution, and that's what we do. We train up we train up church leaders. And so I, th I think in the next slide, it describes our, uh, our mission. Um, if, you, if you go up to um, like the, the heading up at the top that says slideshow, and then, and then click on from the beginning. There we go, yeah. <clears throat> and so we're always trying to, uh, trying to meet that need, and, and like Mike said, stay true to the Bible stay true to the word, and then you can just arrow forward, I, I believe, through those. There you go. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, we're trying to stay through, true to the Bible, stay true to our mission, but as you know, times are changing and, and students are changing. Um, even, I've been there four years, even in the time I've been there, I can see a difference in how the students um, engage, how they engage people, how they engage the word, um, just and how they how they see life. I just in the time I've been there, and there's people that work there, been there a lot longer than I have, and they say, yeah, this is this is what's happening. And so we have an unchanging message, right? We have an unchanging truth, but we have times that are changing, and we have uh, people that are changing how they see the world. And so we're trying to bring these two two worlds together, so to speak, and prepare leaders that that can go out into the world and out into the church and lead well. And it, it's quite a challenge. Um, but so we're always adding. Um, you know, at least trying to, to think about adding new programs. So in the past, this, this past fall, um, so the school year that just ended, in that, in that uh, school year we added programs in Christian ministry, uh, we added a program in, in Christian psychology, that, that's now a department uh, which is basically pre-Christian counseling, and we've added programs in Christian teaching, just, just all in way, trying to engage in ways uh, that are relevant to the students that are coming, and the needs that churches have, and stay true to the mission. So um, in the next slide, um, we have our student numbers. I get asked about this quite a bit, and we always just say we're right at 100. We're right at 100. Um, for the last three semesters, our attendance has come up a little bit. Um, it hasn't come up to the point where we need it, but it is coming up after a few years of, of a little bit of a downtick each year. And so we're right at 100. Um, one problem we're going to have this fall is our dorms. It's a good problem, but we're going to have a problem in, in, in our dorms of uh, where we're going to put all of our students. So that's, we're, we're working on that. But that's, that's, a, that's a good thing, but, but it is a problem. So something to pray about. Um, the next slide. Um, so how Boise Bible College comes along the church, and you can just kind of click through these. But we, we prepare um, senior pastors or lead pastors and youth pastors and worship pastors and, and missionaries and um, children's teachers and pastors. And um, we prepare basically people to go lead in the church. And whether, whether they go back to their home church or go off to another church, we, we see both situations. Um, or maybe they're not even employed full-time in the church at all. We still want them to be able to lead well. 
and uh, so that's that's our that's our mission. Um, there's a lot of uh, I get asked a lot of times, you know, do you offer engineering? Do you offer um, architecture? Do you offer nursing? You know, business? Um, no, we don't. We don't offer any of those. We don't have anything against those. We just that's just not what we do. Um, there are a lot of colleges that do those things, but we we prepare people for ministry. We prepare people um, to lead well in the church, and that's that's really that's that's what we do. So that's how we come alongside the church. Um, that's how we want to answer the need that I presented earlier. So um, that, that's basically what we do at Boise Bible College. We prepare leaders for the church. And again, maybe, you know, some of our graduates aren't going to lead full-time ministry in the church, but we still want them to be able to lead well, to teach well, um, to be that strong, positive presence in, in the church. So um, next slide is, um, is my message. And so we'll... Uh, <clears throat> I'll, I'll be out, you know, around afterwards to answer questions, but um, Boise Bible College is, is might seem like it's way over there. It's not too far over there, and um, this this church has been a partner with us for for uh, many years, and we really appreciate our partner churches. We we could not do this. This always sounds a little cliche to do this, to say this, but we could we really could not do what we do um, without without the support of our our partner churches and, uh, and individuals who, who support us financially and in prayer and by sending students um, over to, uh, to prepare for ministry. And so um, I'll be around afterwards to answer questions and I'll talk a little bit more about what's going on at the college. So um, just to make a little bit of a switch here. I've, I've got weddings on my mind lately. Um, how could I not? My own daughter's wedding is in seven weeks. Um, seven weeks from yesterday, and uh, she actually said, oh, you know, you're actually counting, and I said, yeah, I am counting, because, <laughs> um, and I get asked this all the question, I, all the time, I get asked this question, which I appreciate, is he a good guy? Um, and he is, he is a great guy, I am so blessed, our family is so blessed by the man who is, is uh, you know, the way I see it, is soon going to be my son, and um, so... But not only is my own daughter's wedding coming up, just yesterday I was at my nephew's wedding over in Newburgh, and, um, and that was a great time too. Um, that's actually the fourth wedding I've been to this summer um, between family and, and Bible College students. Um, sometimes Boise Bible College gets called Boise Bridal College, and uh, it has been, it's lived up to that this year, and we've still got more to go. We've got, we've got several weddings um, this year. But weddings are on my mind, and um, I'm going to look at a story today commonly called the wedding feast, or maybe your Bible has a title, the wedding banquet in it. And this is a parable that Jesus told, this is a story that Jesus told, and um, it, it's about, you know, this, what, this, what this parable is about, it, it gets discussed sometimes. W what's he actually talking about? And you, you can come at it from a, a few different angles, but I, I think it's really considering who he's talking to and what he's talking about. It's really about, if you want to boil it down to just a few words, it's about who's in. Who's actually in. And these days, it's not real popular to, to talk about that topic. It, we want to have an approach while well, everybody's in. Everybody's in. It, it doesn't matter. Everybody's in. Jesus says, yeah, it does matter. And, um, you know, if, so if I was to keel over right now, what I, would, what I would want you to hear is those who respond to the invitation and meet the conditions are the ones that are in. And so um, imagine, maybe you don't have to imagine, maybe you've experienced this, I don't know, but imagine you invite several friends over for dinner and you're planning to smoke a brisket. And you're not just cooking hot dogs or something, you know. You're, you're, uh, you're going to smoke a brisket. And they all accept. And they say, yeah, yeah, I'll be there. Yeah, that sounds great. Thank you. You know, that'd be great. And on the day, you get up at 2 o'clock in the morning, right? And you start the smoker. And you get everything all set up. You get the meat out and let it rest let it come to room temperature and or close to it before you set it on the grill, right? All these things you're supposed to do. 
and you go to, you put in all this work, and, and uh, you, you put the meat on the smoker, and you watch it all day. You're cooking it slow, and you're smelling it, and it's great, and you're watching it, and you're checking the temperature. And, and in the meantime, you also work up, you know, the veggies and potatoes and, and a dessert. Can't forget the dessert, right? And a couple hours before dinner time, you text all your friends and say, hey, it'll be ready in two hours. And they reply with, well, first some don't reply, but others reply, oh, you know, we're not going to make it. Something came up. We've got family coming into town. Um, I, I got some stuff I got to get caught up on. Uh, sorry, you know, we're, not, we're just not going to make it. And all your friends who you invited, now they're not coming over, right? And so, so what do you do? You take a picture of the brisket on, <laughs> on the smoker, right, with the smoke coming out, and you send it to them. You text it to them and say, it's, it's really good. It's, it's going to be good. This is my best one yet. And, and you tell them, please, please come over. And so now... Um, you know, you, you've you've not only invited them, but you've sent them the menu and told them told them what's going on. But in the end, none of them actually come over. None of your friends actually come over. So now you've got this great meal that you've spent time and money and work on, and nobody to share it with. You find out that they were just being polite when you invited them in the first time. They were just being polite. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. I'll come over. That'd be great. But they never really meant to come over. They never really intended to come over. And what later on, you're asked about this. You know, what'd you do Friday night? What would you say? Would you say, well, I had a bunch of friends over for dinner? You might say, well, I meant to have a bunch of friends over for dinner. Or would you say, you know, I had, a, I had dinner, I made a dinner, but nobody came. You know, um, Matthew 22, where our story is, is uh, it's sometimes in the Bible, um, chapter breaks and verse breaks, um, some chapter breaks mainly, sometimes they're a little bit unfortunate. They weren't in the original text, you know, um, chapter breaks weren't. And so somebody went through a few hundred years ago and put in chapter breaks, and sometimes those are unfortunate. And so when you come to chapter 22 and you see the wedding feast, the wedding banquet, you might think... Well, hey, there's something new here. There's, there's a new topic, new thought. But that's not really the case. It's, it's simply a, a continuation of what we uh, read in chapter 21. And so I just want to do a quick recap of chapter 21. I want to do this in like 30 seconds if I can. And so you'll be able to just click through these. Um, but there's six events that take place in uh, well, there they are. Uh, six events take place in, in the last week of Jesus' life. And so um, and these are in chapter 21. So the triumphal entry, when he, he comes in and everybody's like celebrating and putting down palm branches and putting down their coats and, and crying Hosanna. That's, that's, that's the tri triumphal entry. And then he goes and he clears the temple, right? He says, you've made it my, my father's house a house of thieves or a den of thieves, and it's supposed to be a house of prayer. And uh, so he goes and clears the temple, flips the tables. There's that event that takes place. And then the next day, Jesus is coming into town, and he's hungry, and he sees a fig tree, and he goes over to get a fig, but lo and behold, it's not producing any fruit. And so what does he do? He curses that tree, and they notice that it withers. And uh, so he, um, it was not producing fruit, even though it appeared to be, you know, false advertising, if you will. Um, and then the authority of Jesus is challenged on, in several different ways, on several different fronts, and essentially he answers and he leaves them speechless. Um, that happens in the midst of all this. And then Jesus shares the parable of the two sons. And so the two sons is the father comes to the first son and, and says, I want you to go work in the field. And he says, yeah, I'll go. But then he doesn't. And he goes to the second son, he says, I want you to go work in the field. And he says, no, I won't go, but then he does. So you, you've, you've heard this story. And the, the question is, which one of them did his father's will? You know, it's the one who actually went. And, and then there's the parable of the tenants, where 
there's a landowner, a vineyard owner, who goes on a, a journey into another country and he rents out his vineyard to uh, some tenants who are supposed to work this vineyard. And, um, and at the time of harvest, he sends his servants to collect the rent, if you will, so to speak, um, the portion of the fruits. And uh, not only are those messengers rejected, they're mistreated, and some of them are killed. And the question is, what's going to happen to those tenants? Well, he'll send, he'll bring those wretches to a wretched end, is what <laughs> is what is going to happen to those tenants. And and then Jesus makes this statement to the people that he's talking to, and the people that he's talking to are the the, the religious leaders of Israel. And he's speaking to Israel, specifically the, the leaders. There's probably others listening in. But he says, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a people producing fruit. And there's a statement there that the leaders perceived that he was talking about them. With all these stories and parables that he's talking about, that he was talking about them, that he's saying something about these religious leaders. He's saying, You appear to be doing something, you appear to be producing fruit, but you're not. And so the kingdom's gonna be taken away from you and given to somebody else who will produce fruit. So that's that's kind of what leads into this parable, this this story of the wedding feast. And um I've got this on the next slide, and it'll, it'll cover a few slides, but I'm just going to read through this, um, through this whole story, and then we'll talk about it a little bit. Um, but it, it, it starts off, and again, and that kind of gives us a, a hint that it just, it's just a continuation of chapter 21. But, and again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who were invited, See, I've prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they, they paid no attention, and they went off. One to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry. And he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. And then he said to the, his servants, The wedding feast is ready. But those, who, uh, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite them to the wedding feast. Um, as many as you find... And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they could find, uh, all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And the man was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. And so, so this story is a continuation of what we saw in, in chapter 21. And I just want to point out a few things about, about the people that, that Jesus is talking to, the people he's, he's talking about. They had already been invited he, he had already extended an, an invitation to them at some point in the past. And when the time came, when they got the text, so to speak, hey, it's going to be in two hours, uh, they refused. They wouldn't come. And if you look at the Greek, it's, a, it's an ongoing refusal. It's, it's not like a, you know, a one time. It's an ongoing. They refused. They, he kept asking, and they, they kept saying no, that um, no, we don't want to come. They never really meant to come in the first place. And so the king tells them the menu. I've butchered my calves and my oxen and um, along with the, dis the, the delicious sides. He says, everything is ready. The feast is ready. Please come. And they still don't come. Now, one thing I noticed about the people that, that, he's, uh, that he invited 
One thing I noticed is some of them are what we would consider responsible people, right? I mean, probably good, upstanding people in the community. Some of them were farmers. Some of them uh, were businessmen. Because, you know, it said some of them had to go off and take care of their business. And, but, you know, some of them were troublemakers. Some of them mistreated the servants, and it's like they didn't have anything better to do but, but cause trouble, and some of them killed the servants. But it's, it's interesting to me that the responsible ones and the troublemakers, all of them, refused to come. They wouldn't come. And so the king's angry. And he, because in that culture, probably we don't understand the, the honor, the culture of honor that, that existed in that culture. We, we probably don't understand that very well today. But for a king to extend an invitation like that and then be, ref, be rejected and be refused, it, it's, it's quite an insult. It was quite uh, something a king wouldn't put up with. And so he, he's angry. He sends his servants, he sends his army to, um, to uh, destroy those murderers and burn the city. And you know, that seems like a harsh act, isn't it, just for being refused? Um, it seems like a harsh act, and if you want to go by extension a little bit here, it seems like a harsh act by God. But he says he's going to try a second time. He's going to extend a second invitation. The banquet is ready, but those who I am invited um, aren't worthy Go to the street corners and find, invite whoever you can find. They're not worthy. Um, the first group, the, re the responsible ones and the troublemakers, they were unworthy to come to the banquet they were invited to. There is another word that today, in our, in our ears today in America, uh, that word probably doesn't fall very well on our ears. We don't, we don't want to hear that. We don't want to hear that there's worthy and unworthy um, and that word might throw us a little bit. It's kind of hard for us to hear. But the word actually does mean unworthy. They weren't worth coming. They weren't worth having to the, to the, to the banquet. Here's another example. And uh, I think this is in our next slide here. In Matthew chapter 10, here, here's another example of how this word is used. Um, it's in Matthew chapter 10. When Jesus sends out the apostles and he sends them out to the Jews and he says, go, go out to all the towns of the Jews and, and tell them that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so they, they go out, not only just to tell them that, but they go out with the ability to do miracles and do good for people that Jesus has given them. And Jesus says this, he, he's given them instructions for, as they go on their journeys, he says, whatever town you enter, find out who's worthy in it and stay there till you depart. If the house is not worthy, let your peace return to you. Now, this doesn't have anything to do with them going into a town and evaluating the moral quality of the people and how good a people they are and, you know, and how outstanding they are. And, um, it has everything to do with who receives their message. And them. And so a couple of verses later, in our next slide, uh, Matthew 10, 14 and 15, he's giving these guys instructions. And he says, if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet. You've probably heard this concept taught. Shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that town. And then he says, it'll be better for Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. You remember what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah, right? God rained down fire upon their cities and destroyed them because of their sinfulness. He says it will be better for them than for these towns that don't receive you. And so in the context and by the meaning of the word, um, worthiness it has to do with who will receive the message of Christ, who will receive Jesus, and, and in this case, who will receive his messengers. So, so back to the parable. It's not what you earn 
It's, it's not about what you earn. It's not about how good you are or how not good you are. We'll talk about that here in just a second. But it's actually the opposite of that. You become worthy by receiving what's offered. These people weren't worthy because they weren't receiving the invitation. They weren't responding to the invitation. They weren't receiving what was offered. And so the king tells his servants, go back out and invite whoever you can find. And so they did. And the words that are used there, it indicates, it says go out to the street, you know, the street corners. It, it has to do with where, where uh, intersections happened in those, in those days. Where, and usually at intersections is where life kind of happened. It's where culture was. It's where businesses were. It's where, it's where people gathered. And, uh, and so they did. The servants went out to the streets. They obeyed. They did what they were told. They went out to the streets, and they invited the good and the bad. It says, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. You know, one thing that struck me about this story is that, that Jesus will fill his wedding hall. He will. He, he, he says, my church will not fail. My church will not be overcome. My word will not come back to me empty. He says, he says these things. He will fill his wedding hall. He, he, that's not going to be a problem for Jesus. It's just a matter of, of who decides to respond to the invitation and receive what, what's offered. And so he sends his servants out, the king does, and, and they, they find the good and the bad. And uh, that might throw our modern American ears too. That might not sound very good to our modern American ears to talk, call somebody good and call somebody bad. Um, again, it's not about moral character, and this is on our next slide. But bad is, uh, it's, it's, it was kind of a hard word for me to understand, but basically it has to do with those who are laden with cares, um, unuseful, just, just a problem, um, just a burden, so to speak, on society, on the people around them. Whereas good would be those who are seen as useful and excellent and fine and, and good. Um, but I don't know. Have you ever felt kind of maybe in that first category? Like, eh, I'm just a burden. I'm just, I'm not all that useful. I don't have that much to offer. Um, nobody wants me. Nobody wants to be around me or have me around them. Um, not much use for me in this world. These are the people that the king sent out the servants to find. People in, in kind of in that category, if you will. And the king wanted them to invite anyone they could find. And they did. And they brought all these people into the wedding hall. And the events has started. And the feast has started. And the festivities are going. And they remember why they're there. They're there to celebrate the king's son. Right? And so the, the party's going, it's going, it's fun, and the food's on the table, and it's great, and the feast is happening, and the music's playing, and, and the laughter, and the, and the good times, and the king walks in. And he sees a man who's not wearing wedding clothes. Now, I was just at a wedding yesterday, and it's probably not quite like it used to be. It used to be a, a wedding was a really formal thing, right? Everybody had suits and ties and nice dresses. It's not quite like that anymore. But you could still tell that people put on generally different clothes to go to a wedding for the most part. Um, even, even yesterday out kind of in an informal setting out in the sun where we were. Um, but... The king walks in and he noticed a man who's not dressed correctly for the wedding. And he stands and he looks at him and he says, Friend, how did you get in here dressed that way? And the man is speechless. And the king has him, he calls in his servants and he has him tied up and thrown out where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Well, it seems harsh. But the man knew he was guilty. His speechlessness says it. 
He, he knew he was guilty, and uh, he refused to wear what he knew he should. Now, remember, this is parable talk. This is, there's, there's some analogies here. There's some, uh, uh, is, is, this isn't all to be taken literally. There's, you know, there's some symbolism, and there's analogies here in, this, in, the, in these parables and these stories as the way Jesus usually taught. But this man shows up to this feast, to this wedding banquet, not wearing what he knows he should be wearing. And he gets called on it and he gets tossed. He gets thrown out. And so there was an expectation that he, he would be dressed correctly. The first group, remember the first group of people that were invited, they insulted by the, the king by not re- coming, by refusing the offer. Um, this guy insulted the king by not dressing correctly. And the king won't be insulted. You won't get away with it. You will not get away with insulting the king. For many are invited, but few are chosen. So remember who Jesus' audience is in the context of chapter 21. Jesus is speaking to Israel's leaders here. Um, Israel over the centuries prior to that, um, had, and its leaders, had been invited. Many refused the invitation, and then the servants invited everyone. That's just basically how, how history played out. Um, even in that group, there were some who enjoy, would not enjoy the feast. And it's a powerful statement that, that Jesus makes to his audience, that Jesus will fill his table. He will fill his wedding hall. Um, so how does this apply to us? Just as we kind of begin to wrap up here. How does this apply to us? The last statement there powerfully summarizes the parable and the previous ones, all those previous stories we looked at in the last chapter, where Jesus says, many are called, but few are chosen. And I think Jesus is teaching about faithfulness. He's teaching about responding to the invitation. He's, he's teaching about producing fruit. These people that he was speaking to say they're the people of God, and yet they haven't been faithful. They haven't produced fruit. And so Jesus says the kingdom is like a wedding feast. He uses this story, this parable of a wedding feast. And they know, again, I was just at a wedding yesterday. I've been at several this year. And one thing I've noticed is the wedding feast Jesus is talking about is not like the ones we're used to in America. They're, they're, not, they're not really the same. Um, there's a major difference. At, at our wedding feasts, and I'm sure most of you have been to weddings and, and hosted weddings probably in some cases, at, at our wedding feasts, we invite the people that we know and we like, right? <laughs> we invite family and friends, and it's, it's a restricted bunch of people usually. We invite people that we know and we like. And if we're not careful, we'll do that in the kingdom too. We'll only invite the people that we know and we like. So on our next slide, we'll, we'll treat the kingdom like a private party. We will. If we're not careful, we'll get to thinking that This church thing is pretty nice, and I've been there. This church thing is pretty nice, and and this is just for me, and this is just for the people that I like and the people that I know and the people that are like me, those with with similar thinking and values and political views and those that are easy to get along with. But the king sent them out to invite whoever they could find, right? And they obeyed. And they went, and Jesus' wedding hall was filled. They invited anyone they could find, the good and the bad. And so the servant's role was not to judge the worthiness of those being invited. Their role was to invite. And what would happen in the church if we just went out and invited anyone and everyone, whoever we could find, it's not easy. I wrestle with it. I think it's a struggle because, I mean, let's just be honest. 
We want to play the role of the king and not the servant. It was the king who walked in and noticed the man not dressed properly, right? It was the king who gave the order for him to be removed. The king gave the judgment on that man. And uh, that's our next slide. We, we want to play the role of the king all too often. We want to notice who they are. We want to notice what they believe before we think they can join us. And then we cast judgment on them. In this parable, it's the king who's the one who weeds out those who are invited from those who are chosen, those who are faithful. I might burst a bubble here, but there's only one king, and it's not you. Many are invited, few are chosen. That's our next slide. Many are invited, few are chosen. In other words, just because you're invited doesn't mean you're faithful or chosen. And the faithful and the chosen come to celebrate the son. That's the reason they're there. There's no other reason they're there. It's to celebrate the son. And so the father, if you want to spiritualize this parable, the father, God, extends this invitation to everyone. He wants us to come and celebrate his son, Jesus. He wants us to come and be in relationship with his son, Jesus. And uh, he wants us to come and follow his son, Jesus. And he extends this invitation. And the only way we become worthy of being there is by accepting that invitation. There's no other way to be worthy. Um, Being good enough is not good enough. There's no other way to be worthy. Um, That's what the king wants. He wants his son celebrated. That's all he wants. He wants his son celebrated. And so verse 14 is the punchline for the fig tree and the other the other parable, uh, parables many uh, many are chosen uh, many are invited few are chosen. So what does it mean to be chosen? And I think this will be our last uh, slide or two. Um so the chosen just looking at our uh, our parable here the chosen produce fruit not just look good. The chosen actually produce fruit. The chosen obey the Father and work the vineyard. The chosen don't just quit because the work is hard. Um, The chosen give to God what is his. And the chosen invite without judgment. Um, So how we live is an invitation. How we speak about others is an invitation. How we disagree with others is an invitation, can be an invitation. How we love others is an invitation. How we deal with adversity is an invitation. Remember, Jesus' audience here is the spiritual leaders and the Jews who are in attendance at the temple. He calls them trees with no fruit. He calls them lying children. He calls them wretched tenants. He calls them unworthy Invitees, invitees. I think these parallel, or these par- parables, should cause us to look in the mirror and repent on our knees. We're all guilty of inviting only those we want at the table. We're guilty of letting stuff and sin <clears throat> entangle us. But I just want us to remember this morning that the kingdom of heaven is not a private party. Go and invite people into the truth. Go and invite whoever you can find into the truth, into the feast, into the party. Be the servant of God who invites those. And just one last thought. If you're in that category of um, maybe you feel like a burden, maybe you feel like nobody wants you, maybe you feel like there's no use for me, Um, You're in that category who has refused the invitation thus far. (laughs) There's still time. There's still grace. The the feast is still, um, you're still invited to the feast. It's still happening. It's it's still uh, still an event that, that God 
wants people there celebrating his son. And so if that's a choice, if that's a response you have yet to make, there's still time, but I encourage you to do it today while there's still time, while you know there's still time to respond to that invitation to come to the feast, to be among those who are in celebrating the son. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for this uh, story. Lord, I pray that uh, the truth of it will sit in our hearts and will change our hearts. And Lord, I, I pray that you would start with me and that, and that you would change my heart and help me to look at those around me and, and be not, not judging of them and trying to separate them into to my categories, but to see them how you see them, Lord, to be one who invites them to your truth and one that invites them to your table. Lord, help me to be your servant. Help me to not want to play your role. Help me to let you be God and let you be the one who, uh, who makes the right calls, the right judgments. And Lord, just help me to be a servant who loves people. And Lord, I thank you for the grace that you extend to me. I thank you for the salvation that we find in Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray that as many people can find that as possible. Lord, I thank you for this fine group of people. I thank you for Gates Community Church of Christ and their partnership with Voice of Bible College and their ministry to the community around them, especially the last few years. I thank you for their heart for people and just the way you've worked mightily through this, this body. I pray that you would continue that and strengthen them, embolden their hearts, help them to continue to uh, represent you well and live for you in these changing times to stay true to their mission, to, to, uh, to keep their eyes on you and, and being your servants. And Lord, we thank you and we love you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay. Well, God has this issued an invitation to the banquet. And if you'd like to accept that invitation, you can come forward to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Invitation is also open for those of us who sometimes we have put ourselves as the king. And we need to answer the call to become servants. So if you'd like to rededicate your life, you can come forward as well. Come as we stand and sing. Blessed be he the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above. When we asunder part, it gives us inward pain. But we shall still be joined in heart and hope to meet again. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day that you've made, that we can come and worship and praise you. God, just help us, send us out into this canyon to invite people to you, to invite people to the banquet of your Son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. So we're going to go get some snacks, and you can visit for a while, and then I'll call everybody back to in here if you'd like to stay and hear more about Boise Bible College. <laughs>